Hi everyone, this is uh, Mick Make Mail number 18 and I've got a couple of interesting things. So first up, I'm pretty sure I know what this is because it's written on the side of the box in Berry. So I was contacted by the Banana Pie people and they asked me if I wanted to review a couple of their SBCs. So there's a couple that I didn't actually have time to review. Um, and so they've kindly sent me these ones. Okay, so nice. So they sent me, um, get out of the way. So they sent me uh, the Banana Pie uh, router 2. It's a bit of a step up from the previous model. Um, as, in fact you'll find out a lot of these boards are fairly similar. There's only a few differences between them. But the Banana Pi R2 runs a MediaTek MT7623N uh, which is a quad-core um, Cortex-A7. Uh, it's got 2 gigs DDR3 RAM. Uh, it's got EMMC. I think. Oh uh, yeah, EMMC there. Uh, it's got SD slot on the back. Um, 6 gig uh, SATA interface and now it's got two of them on this one uh, they I think Banana Pi sell two different models one with only one SATA connector and one with two um, it's also got mini PCI interface uh, and 5 gigabit Ethernet uh, one that's sort of configured as a WAN interface and the other one is a local network so it's running the MediaTek switch uh, what else has got? Uh, of course the AP6212 Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. You'll see that sort of chip on all the boards these days. Two USB 3.0, one USB 2.0. Uh, it's also got LiPo battery support and of course the standard 40 pin GPO output. It runs off a 12 volt 2 amp DC jack power supply compared to uh, having a micro USB, it's terrible. Um, so that's, this will be a good board to try out. It'll be interesting to see if this is an improvement on the R1. So next one. Now uh, they also sent me a Banana Pi M3. So the Banana Pi M3 is a bit of a powerhouse. Uh, it's running the OctaCore A83T Cortex-A7. Uh, so eight CPUs, it's nice. It's in a fairly similar format to a Raspberry Pi, uh, but this one's got two gigs DDR3 RAM. Uh, there's also eight gig EMMC there. Uh, there's SD on the back, standard sort of format. Gigabit Ethernet, it's only USB 2.0. Uh, I've got a standard GPIO header, of course, a little microphone there and infrared, audio jack, MIPI CSI and DSI. Uh, all the usual stuff, of course SATA as well, uh, which is nice, um, and the usual AP6212 Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, of course. Um, so it's a fairly similar formula. Let's crack out a Raspberry Pi and see what the difference is. So you can see it's you know, almost similar. It's not a standard Raspberry Pi format, so don't expect this to fit into any of the Raspberry Pi cases. It's slightly longer. MIPI DSI and CSI are in this roughly the same spot. The GPIO is in roughly the same spot. So you could probably use this as a replacement for a Pi. But it's, you know, it's the same format, it's an the core CPU, so that's nice. And they also sent me a Banana Pi M2 Berry, which is a fairly similar format to a Raspberry Pi. There's a lot of boards these days coming out uh, resembling the same Raspberry Pi format. Everyone's sort of cottoning on to the fact that the Raspberry Pi format is, is here to stay, I guess. Uh, so if you compare it to a Raspberry Pi, it's exactly the same. Same uh, pinout on all sides, uh, except this one. Uh, this contains the quad-core V40, uh, which is Cortex-A7. Uh, one gig DDR3, of course the usual SD slot, SATA, um, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, of course, via the AP6212, USB 2.0, uh, gigabit Ethernet, uh, running off uh, 5 volts 2 amps. It's, this is, of course, using the, the standard micro USB connector. Uh, now, the, the difference between the two, really, is um, a faster CPU and 
SAS are on board. You can see the MIPI, CSI, DSI, GPIOs are all there, um, but it's essentially a step up from the Raspberry Pi. So thanks to the Banana Pi people for sending those uh, through for a, uh, a review. Uh, it'd be nice to see what they're like and how they compare to the previous models. All right, so next. So this uh, next one, I have no idea where it's come from. Boxes. Okay, this is interesting. Wonder what this is. Ah, okay. This is a surprise. I suspect this might be a Kickstarter I backed. There's no name. What well, was the name I don't recognize? Uh, it's coming from China. Hmm, interesting. I might have to look this one up. Ah, excellent. So, this was a Kickstarter I backed uh, some months ago called the IO Linker. And for some reason, it was never delivered. Um, I don't know what happened. The campaign creator contacted me and, uh, and resent the, the, the package. So anyway, it's running a Lattice FPGA. It's got 49 GPIOs uh, splattered out, um, which are capable of UART, SPI, ITC, all sorts of things, uh, running off 3.3 volt logic. Um, they've got an open source library that they've uploaded to GitHub. I'm pretty excited about this one. So uh, this would be a really nice one to get into, and I've got two of them. So excellent, excellent. I am really excited about this. Um, and I think they're both, yeah, they're both the same. So I got two of them. Uh, so, solder time. Okay, so this is going to take a while. So uh, just whistle to yourself quietly. Okay, so I wired everything up to an Arduino Leonardo. Of course, I had to use uh, voltage level uh, converter. Uh, stepping down from 5 volts down to 3.3. I use Serial 1 of the Leonardo uh, using the Arduino IDE. Um, unfortunately, I just can't get any response out of it. I don't know why. It's, it's a real shame because I wanted to get this going. Definitely getting some sort of TX out of the Leonardo, but I'm just not getting any response back at all. So it's a real shame. So I thought I'd try it uh, using a, a bog standard uh, Linux PC. So I've got this handy dandy TTL UART to RS232 converter and also logic level because this is a this one is a 5 volt TTL output connected up to the IO linker. Unfortunately, I can't connect to it at all. So this is a bit frustrating. Um, I was really excited about these boards, so I need to shoot an email off to uh, to the uh, creator. Um, of this board and find out what's going on. Ah, I was just uh, about to throw out the, little, the, the uh, bag that it came in and I noticed that he's actually gone and created a what looks like a USB thumb drive. Oh yeah, so it's just a little flash drive. It's a bit of a gimmick but that's just pretty cool. And I'd say he's probably got uh, some FPGA um, firmware on, on this as well. Excellent. Okay, so the last one is another Kickstarter uh, because it says Digilant on the front. And this is a Kickstarter I backed some time ago. Nice. So this is the uh, Open Scope. Uh, and if you missed the Kickstarter, it was, I think, uh, almost a year ago, I think it was probably six, no, probably six months ago. So the open scope is pretty good. It's uh, running the PIC32 MZ MCU, um, and it's capable of getting up to. I could open these boxes. It's got two scope channels uh, at up to 12 bits resolution uh, and two megahertz bandwidth. Uh, it's also got a function generator up to one megahertz. Uh, there's also 10 pins that can be used as GPIOs or alternatively as a 10 channel logic analyzer. Uh, it's got onboard Wi-Fi, uh, which is nice um, for remote analysis. Uh, what else is there? You, know, you can update the uh, firmware via USB uh, using Arduino IDE or I think the microchip MP Lab. Uh, they've also got uh, all the schematics up there so you can download the schematics and and uh, make your own if you want to. Uh, it's also got an SD slot. Let's give this one a whirl and see what it looks like. So I'm using the web-based uh, logic analyzer. So I've got to go through this whole uh, installation and setup process. Um, if you read the guide, you'll see that it's uh, you've got to calibrate it and you've got to do all this other stuff, load the, upload the latest firmware and so forth. 
So if you've used any Digilent products before, then you'll have used uh, Waveform software. Um, unfortunately, you can't use that with uh, the OpenScope, but you have access to a web-based interface, which is a little bit funky as it relies on internet access for it to work, um, but it work seems to work well. Of course, you'll need to download and install the agent. Uh, once the agent is installed and running, you can then add a device, which prompted me to update the firmware, uh, then go through a calibration process. So calibrating, uh, they say you need to take the solid red wire. Uh, I'm just going to use one of these jumpers to uh, connect them up. You know, take the solid red uh, and the solid orange um, and connect them together to go through the calibration process. So I'm just going to connect them up this way. Okay. Uh, and next we need to connect up the solid blue to the solid white. There you go. Nice. So the next thing, I wanted to see if I could access the OpenScope over Wi-Fi. Um, I could connect to the access point, but couldn't get any response out of it. Connecting to the onboard web browser seems to redirect the Waveform Live website. Not sure if that's what's supposed to happen, but it wouldn't ever connect. Okay, so I've set it to a one kilohertz um, square wave, and it's a little bit noisy. I suspect it's just due to the fact that um, I don't have a good earth. Oh no, okay. It's, it's fairly decent. Let's uh, ramp this up to a higher frequency. hundred kilohertz uh, square wave okay it's a fairly decent sort of square wave There's still a bit of noise on it though and go up to a one one meg yeah it's a little bit noisy um, it's not exactly a square wave it's more of a, a sinusoidal wave let's try one of the other um, waveforms so sawtooth yeah, it's pretty decent as a sawtooth, but to be honest, you're not going to be getting a $5,000 quality bit of equipment um, out of $99 uh, US. So next I loaded up the LED fade example from the Arduino IDE, which uses the slow PWM method. It showed up a fairly clean waveform, but this was at a very low clock rate. So notice that there's also a fair amount of lag since it's a web-based application after all. Okay, to check out this open scope um, with a fast clock rate, I set the stem terror board to an emit an 8 megahertz uh, clock uh, just using the uh, timer counters on the uh, at mega. You can see it's just struggling to keep up with it. Um, this is the, the Crow, uh, which is a 25 megahertz bandwidth. Uh, you can see the open scope is uh, sort of really struggling to keep up with it. Um, and this is the the lowest range I've got on, on this uh, particular DSO, uh, which is 25 nanoseconds. Uh, if, I, if I zoom down on the open scope, you can see the individual samples. It's really struggling to actually produce uh, any decent sort of output. Um, it's got a logic analyzer, so let's try that one out next. So I wrote a uh, fairly simple sketch, which outputs uh, ASCII 9, which ends up being uh, hexadecimal 39, uh, which gives you this uh, typical uh, pattern. So uh, as a logic analyzer it works quite well as well. The OpenScope also has uh, SPI inputs as well. Um, I haven't actually tested those out. So uh, what do I think of the OpenScope? I think for 99 US dollars it's pretty good. It's a fairly decent uh, scope and logic analyzer. It's not a whiz-bang one if you're looking at anything uh, greater than really megahertz frequency or two megahertz then you start to get a lot of fall off it just doesn't have the sample rates unfortunately uh, Wi-Fi is a nice feature uh, it allows you to remotely connect unfortunately I wasn't able to remotely connect to it I believe there's some weird requirement with the Wi-Fi channel of your access point being not sitting on channel 11 and 12 or 23 or 24 whatever it is a bit strange but anyway probably more features than you'll find in a 
a Chinese knockoff. Uh, but yeah, it's overall it's a really nice board. However, the, the clips are a bit dodgy, I found. Uh, they often, the clips often pop out. So if you've got one of these, just be careful. Uh, that's, they tend to just not really lock in properly and they just come off. So uh, that's one thing to be careful of. Anyway, that's about it for the mailbag. Thanks for watching and see you next week.